Will you please pray with me? O Heavenly Father, Father, Divine Mother, Mother, Beloved Jesus Christ, Christ, Blessed Master, Master, Dearest Mother, Mother, Saints and Sages of all religions, religions, I bow to all of you. you. Free Free my life from all obstacles. And give me physical, mental, and spiritual development. And give me physical, mental, and spiritual development. Make my mind thy temple. Make my mind thy temple. Make my heart thy altar. Make my heart thy altar. Make my love thy home. Make my love thy home. Be thou the only king. Be thou the only king. Reigning on the throne of my consciousness. Reigning on the throne of my consciousness. Ooh. article that I cut out of the newspaper, a focus on reprogramming the brain. Research work to retrain organ to overcome problems by Lorian Niergaard in the Associated Press, Washington. Do genes determine your brain's abilities or can you retrain the brain to surmount inherited problems such as helping a learning impaired child to read? Neuroscientist Michael Mersenich has proved that special training focusing on specific brain regions can help some children with dyslexia and other language-related disabilities to learn. Sophisticated neural imaging shows that retraining using computerized educational games leads to physical changes in the brain. If it works for dyslexia, Mersenich reasons Why not for more profound neurological disorders like autism or schizophrenia? His theory, such disorders aren't simply inherited illnesses. Instead, they're inherited brain weaknesses that can turn into full-blown disorders only when the ever-changing brain essentially gets stuck in the wrong gear and what might be possibly to reverse. And, what, and that might be possible to reverse. There's a real prospect of understanding these conditions through understanding the brain as an operational machine that in a sense creates its own capacities, explains Mersenich of the University of California, San Francisco. It sounds provocative, but as Mersenich discussed the latest research at the National Institute of Health meeting last week, neuroscientists said said recent years have brought widespread agreement that the brain's plasticity, continual changes that let us learn new things every day, sometimes veers out of control, causing developmental disorders once attributed solely to bad genes. The challenge now is to understand normal learning well enough to interfere with plasticity go, when plasticity goes bad. Mersenich calls it raising a brain. Think of the brain as a changeable computer. As birth, at birth, much of the hardware isn't hooked up and little software is running. But the brain physically changes as it learns and each change enables new learning and more changes evolution built on experience. Take vision. Newborns see very little. Day by day, messages sent from the eyes to the region in the back of the brain literally hook up neural vision circuitry until babies can see normally. But studies of monkeys show patching over one eye makes the brain rewire itself to see only with the uncovered one. It is a use it or lose it game during development, says Harvard Medical School, Carla Schatz. Change isn't limited to childhood. 
Other scientists have painstakingly counted how many new brain cells grow in adult rats. Very few if they are kept in plain, boring cages, but lots if they learn to use exercise wheels. In humans, brain scan scanning MRI machines show regions involving and involved in playing music, for example, grow and become intricately wired during practice. But a genetic flaw can knock the whole cycle off kilter, and that's where the remedial work comes in. And from the wi wisdom of James Allen, a philosopher born in 1850s. Thought and purpose. Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. With the majority, the ship of thought is allowed to drift upon the ocean of life. Aimlessness is a common vice, and such drifting must not continue for him who would steer clear of catastrophe and destruction. They who have no central purpose in their life fall easy prey to petty worries, fears, troubles, and self-pityings, all of which are indications of weakness which lead just as surely as deliberately planned sins, though by a different route, to failure, unhappiness, and loss. For weakness cannot persist in a power-evolving universe. A man should conceive of a legitimate purpose in his heart and set out to accomplish it. He should make this purpose the centralizing point of thoughts. It may take the form of a spiritual ideal, or it may be a worldly object according to his nature at the time being. But whatever it is, he should steadily focus his thought forces upon the object which he has set out before him. He should make this purpose his supreme duty and should devote himself to its attainment, not allowing his thoughts to wander into fleeting fancies, longings, and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control and true concentration of thought. Even if he fails again and again to accomplish his purpose, as he necessarily must until weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success. Reread that. The strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success. And this will form a starting point in his life for future power and triumph. Those who are not prepared for the apprehension of a great purpose should fix their thoughts upon the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may appear. Only in this way can the thoughts be gathered and focused and resolution and energy be developed, which being done, there is nothing which may not be accomplished. Strength grows with purpose. The weakest soul, knowing its own weakness and believing this truth, that strength can be developed by effort and practice, will thus believing at once begin to exert itself. And by adding effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength, will never cease to develop and will at last grow divinely strong. As the physically weak man can make himself strong by carefully and patient training, so the man of weak thoughts can make them strong by exercising himself in right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness and to begin to think with purpose is to enter the ranks of those strong ones who only recognize failure as one of the pathways to attainment, who make all conditions serve them, and who think strongly, attempt fearlessly, and accomplish masterfully. Having conceived of his purpose, a man should mentally mark out a straight pathway to its achievement, looking neither to the right nor the left. Doubts and fears should be rigorously excluded. They are disintegrating elements which break up the straight line of effort, rendering it crooked, ineffectual, useless. Thoughts of doubt and fear never accomplish anything and never can. They always lead to failure. Purpose, energy, power to do, and all strong thoughts cease when doubt and fear creep in. 
eliminate doubt and fear. The will to do springs from the knowledge that we can do. Doubt and fear are the great enemies of knowledge. And he who encourages them, he who does not slay them, thwarts himself at every step. He who has conquered doubt and fear has conquered failure. His every thought is allied with power, and all difficulties are bravely met and wisely overcome. His purposes are reasonably planted, and they bloom and bring forth fruit, which does not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. He who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger than a mere bundle of wavering thoughts and fluctuating sensations. He who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his mental powers. I would like to speak this evening on commitment. Within all relationships in this world, commitment plays a vital and essential role. We come into this world, so to speak, with a commitment to our soul, a commitment for growth, a commitment to gain understanding and knowledge, experience, and to give of ourselves for the evolution, not only of our own soul, but this world soul as well. It is only through sustained effort that we will come into the fullness of our knowledge of who and what we truly are, and to bring that light fully into our evolutionary commitment to ourselves, to our own souls, and to this world. Throughout all the history of man, those who have made strong commitments are the ones who have excelled within this world. When we make an agreement with someone, that should be a fast agreement that is unwavering and that makes it something that we cannot live without. We make so many agreements there are nations that make agreements with nations through treaties, through understandings, through an ability to work one with another. There are governments that make agreements with the people if they are what they should be. They work for the people and respond to the people. And to the degree that they do this, they fulfill their true and divine nature and purpose. Within our own lives, we make many commitments. We make commitments to perhaps work for another individual or for a company. And through that commitment, we make an agreement to show up at a particular time, to accomplish certain tasks, and to fulfill what it is that we, that the nature of that corporation or that company, to help it to prosper, to help it to grow, to help it fulfill its role of service within this world. Within relationships, within friendships, we make commitments to one another. Those commitments may be to perform certain functions, or to show a certain amount of loyalty, or to arrive at a place at a particular time, and to keep that commitment. The more we make those commitments and honor them, the more our character develops. This reading this, tonight from this newspaper article is very important. There is this raging controversy within the world of physiology, within the world of psychology. Is it nature or is it nurture? Nature would say that genetics and our physical body are the determinants of our future, of our abilities, of our capacity to work, for even our character. Nurture says that it is our environment that forms us, that makes our character, and we are more subject to those things that are surrounding us.
For the spiritual man and woman, it is recognized that the primary relationship is always between the individual self, the Atman, the soul, and the supreme soul, the Paramatman. And through that relationship, the capacity of human beings is fully explored, explored and fulfilled. It is a learning ground that we find ourselves here on Earth. When we come here, we are, in fact, most often very strongly influenced by those people around us, by our own neurophysiology. It's a fascinating thing. One of the things that Master says is that when the ovum and the spermatozoa come together to form the singular cell, an astral light is emitted out from that cell and attracts different souls to it, souls that have a resonance, that have a certain vibration, that has in common with the character and makeup of that soul, perhaps of its environment. And through the karmic patterns, or depending upon the evolution of the soul, perhaps a conscious entity making a choice to come in to that body, because that body will fulfill the purpose that that soul needs for its own karmic uh, fulfillment or for a conscious evolution. During the time of gestation and the cells beginning to multiply and form a body, what was shown to me inwardly is that the soul resides above that formation of a body and helps to guide and determine different choices that are made in the genetic patterns as that soul, that body, begins to develop. And so, depending on the, um, the needs of that soul and its karmic patterns, there may be genetic choices that determine the weaknesses that are talked about in this article within the genetic pattern. It may be a predisposition towards serious illness, or perhaps a very strong constitution. It's very interesting within the same family that one child can be born and be physically subject to many illnesses and difficulties, while another child is born and is a robust kind of constitution. Now, it would seemingly stand the chance that if they came from such close genetic stock, that they would have a similar combination. And from that similar combination, they would have a similar constitution. But we find that that's not the truth. The truth is, is that there can be wide varieties. Now, perhaps the geneticist would explain all of that through the happen chance combination of the genes within that pool. But when you think that the soul is hovering above, the consciousness is beginning to blend with that body. And as that blending happens, the development with that body begins to reflect more and more the soul that has come to inhabit that body. Amazingly enough, we are almost six billion strong here on Earth. And yet it is said that human birth is still difficult to come by. It's a rare experience. When you think about the complexities of karmic patterns, not only for the individual, but that groups of souls come to incarnate together. And what specific combinations of both genetics as well as social factors need to be present in order to fulfill the karmic conditions for any particular soul. When you begin to multiply these out, you'll see that it is a vast number of variables that come into play in order to fulfill the karmic requirements for any particular soul or any group of souls. And it's a fascinating drama that it goes on day after day as new souls come into this earth and souls leave this earth. The dance of life is incredible. It is really quite remarkable. When we lose our fear of death, we begin to see the real beauty of this life, of how Life enters, 
into a physical body, into this earth. It is, for a while, retained upon this stage of earthly activity. And then it takes its own choosing and decides when to leave. This coming and going happens like the ebb and flow of the tides that are constantly at change, moving in, moving out, in a beautiful rhythm. All of life reflects that beautiful rhythm. The seasons reflect that beautiful rhythm. There are just so many ways in nature reflecting that grand design of the divine being and consciousness that makes it perfect and beautiful and wonderful to behold. The idea of sin and that we are born into sin, that this world has been taken over by Satan and is ruled by Satan as is purported, purported by so many of different religions, is such an alien thought when you touch in and realize the great beauty and intelligence, the loving hand that has gone into creating everything that is, who could look at this magnificent creation and call it anything but a creation of God? It is the small, immature minds that look only on the surface of life and see its evil, see its dark warfare, to see the misdeeds that go on, and truly these things do go on. This world is dark with warfare from that standpoint. But that is only looking at the surface of this life. To look beneath the surface is to see the true miracle of life, that the light of being shines within every soul, that the intelligence that goes into making this body to keep it functioning, that the light of the sun shines equally on the just and the unjust, the loving and those who are filled with hatred. But nevertheless, their own lives individually are miracles in creation. Each and every life reflects its own divine creator. And if for a time that soul reflects the darkness of ignorance, it does not stain that which is perfect, that which is beautiful. In order to realize that beauty, in order to realize that perfection, we enter into the commitment of sadhana. That commitment must go very deep and, and be very strong indeed. Many times I have come to the conclusion that it can be no ordinary drive that takes us to divine consciousness. Most people are of mixed nature. They want to approach God. They want to know God. I think every individual who has walked this earth at some point in their life has wondered about their own nature, who they really are, what the real nature of the world is. And even the most dense-minded individual must stand in awe of the stars, of nature, of the panorama that is seen around us that must wonder at their own nature at certain times. But for many people, that is a passing phase. Perhaps there is a great disaster that happens in an individual's life. And because of that disaster, they have some fleeting moments of deepened prayer. They really yearn to know the true nature of their lives. They yearn to be out of that pain that they've been brought into. But so oftentimes that too is a fleeting thought and a fleeting desire. Here and there you will find rising up out of many thousands there will be one and another one over there who will be rising, raising their heads up to look for what is beyond this life what the true nature of their own life is. But for so many, that too is of just a short duration. They make some efforts at it. They have some interest in it. 
and then their head sinks back down into the ocean of ignorance once again. And they dream a dream. They dream a dream of living in this life, of being called by a certain name, of gaining a certain amount of wealth and prestige and all the rest of it. Or perhaps they dream a nightmare dream where they are unhappy, dissatisfied, and yet not having any clear idea of what they want. We must, if we are to be successful at anything, establish a clear purpose in our mind. That purpose must have some real focus of attention. Without that focus of attention, the purpose may be high, it may be good, but it will not get us what we want. We must grow committed to that purpose. We must clarify that vision of what it is that we want to accomplish. We must know what the outcome should be in order to measure our own progress and to see whether we're making true progress towards our purpose or not. All of this is a way of saying that this commitment that we make to this spiritual path must be complete. It cannot be of an ordinary nature. It can't be a passing phase. It can't be here today or while we're concentrating here in meditation and the moment we walk out, it's passed out of our minds. It must stand as the preeminent purpose and goal within our life. And until we can make that form of commitment, until we can bring that kind of purpose into our life, then we will not realize the results that we are yearning for. It cannot be an ordinary commitment. It cannot be one that is passing and fluctuating. It has to be steady, like a bright light burning with a steady purpose. I think one of the great things that our spiritual masters that have preceded us have shown us is that great commitment. Every one of them was very individualistic in the way that they expressed their realization, in the way that they expressed the truth that they came to teach. But each one had that tenacity of purpose, that real commitment in their soul, that could not let go of it. Mother used to describe herself like a dog that got a hold of the end of the bone with somebody else at the other end of the bone, and she never let go. She never gave up. She'd hold on to the end of that bowl with everything that she had. She was like that with God. She was like that with our souls. She was determined to lift us into higher consciousness. But who was there for the long run? Who was there who could make that con commitment to her? Because the commitment doesn't run just one way. It runs both ways. And the guru has already paid the price. They have already known what it is to commit themselves and to keep that commitment. It is up to us as disciples to prove our commitment and to move in that direction with steadiness of purpose, with a flame burning bright and steady within ourselves. Each time we fall short of that mark, we have to reorient ourselves. We have to come back with even a stronger commitment. It must be said that ultimately, it is God who is making the commitment within you because it is not that ordinary commitment. It is not the fluctuating commitment that so many make about doing things in their lives. It has to be something that burns so brightly that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what life brings you in all of its vicissitudes, it will not deter you. It will not stay your course. But rather, you will be committed beyond all reason because ultimately you have to go beyond reason. You have to be committed to that degree where Everything is set aside, and you make that first in your life. The promise, the 
great promise that is made when we do that is that our lives will change. When we have that level of commitment, we will no longer be wavering. We will have that steady light. No matter what comes into our life, we will always, like a compass, turn back to the right direction. And no matter how much you shake that compass up, your internal compass will always come back pointing in the right direction. There are many tests that come into this life of a sadhaka. There are many tests. And each one can challenge us right down to the core of our being. There is the test of what other people think of us. Will others find criticism of us? Will they agree with us? There, are, there is the test of endurance. Can we stay the course even when we don't particularly feel like it? Even though when our personality would rather turn from the light, can we still stay the course? There is the test of death. The death of the ego, the death of the self, the death of being in control of our lives as we surrender ourselves to that infinite consciousness. That is a great test. And there is the test that goes beyond all reason when we cannot reason our way through it, when we cannot see our way through it, and yet we hang on with faith, with a commitment that defies all reason. And because of that kind of commitment, Krishna says, out of all of those who are inspired to rise up into heights and in gaining great heights, there are very few indeed that go the whole way. And as Papa used to say, realization of God is no joke. It is no joke. We can play with this path and be in it and be out of it, and be back in it, and be back out of it again. But then we will get unequal results because that will be reflected in the nature of our commitment. It is only when that commitment is 100% will we be able to put our full lives in surrendered commitment at the feet of God and Guru. And when we do that, we empty ourselves completely of ourselves, which is to say the ego, and we become a waiting chalice that will be filled with the wine and the nectar and the realization of our oneness with God. Do not separate your life out. Every relationship has that commitment aspect to it. When you enter into agreements, do not take them lightly, for every one of them is a practice run, so to speak, at your divine commitment. When you make a promise to someone, strive with everything in your ability to keep that commitment. When you enter into a work relationship, strive with everything within you to honor that work relationship. Make your life a sterling example of what that commitment is, what it means. Enter into it consciously. Strive to keep those commitments completely. Strive to be on time when you make a commitment to meet at a certain time. Strive to accomplish a task when you make an, a, commi a commitment to accomplish that task. Bring clarity to your relationships. So many partnerships and business relationships do not succeed because there has not been a clarity of purpose to begin with. It starts on a hope and a prayer, so to speak. But when you bring that commitment, you bring your whole self and through bringing your whole self, you bring clarity to that relationship. There is a quality to a life when that clarity exists. You feel 
to put it into some words you feel clear and clean in your relationships with people. You don't feel that things are kind of dirty and the aura around yourself, between yourself and another person. You don't feel dark shadows around it. You don't have fear of being exposed because you haven't been fully truthful or you're not honoring the commitments and so you don't avoid other people. One of the things that Sri Yukteswar asked Master when he first met him, he says, promise you will never avoid me. And Master said many times that was the most difficult commitment for him to keep up because Sri Yukteswar was not easy on him. He was training him for a great purpose and he was training him in the fires of wisdom but Master's love shone through, and he never avoided him. He always went back to him, no matter how difficult, no matter how purifying those fires were. He never avoided him. And what was the result? He grew spiritually. He became like a pure flame. Such a powerful and wonderful devotee growing into a master a spiritual master. And so each one of us should not avoid those things that are difficult because those things that are difficult are purifying to the soul. It's said one time that if you have a choice between two options, always choose the more difficult one and you'll probably be choosing correctly. It's not that we have to go out and create a lot of pain and suffering in our life but we should be sure that we are never avoiding something because it is difficult. Because our commitment towards ourselves, our commitment towards our realization must always come first. And that commitment means going into those purifying fires in order that we might be cleansed of the ego stains that are within us and become that pure flaming light. Are there thoughts or questions about anything that I've spoken on or on your own sadhana? Mother used to say that marriage is our preparation for our marriage with God, marriage with another person. Of course, we promise to honor another person in the marital relationship. We make a commitment of joining our lives with another person. When we honor another person, we don't presume too much about that other person. There is a little distance between ourselves and another. Master used to emphasize the fact not to become overly familiar within a marital relationship and within all relationships, as a matter of fact. When we become overly familiar with another, we feel a certain right to take liberties. Oftentimes within marital relationships, we speak to that individual in a way that we would never speak to anybody else, friend or foe. And that's not right because within every relationship, there's like an invisible bank account going on. And with each positive vibration, 
deposited in that bank account, a kind of a savings starts to accrue, a vibration of respect, a vibration of mutual purpose begins to evolve. With each negative comment, thought, word, or action is like a withdrawal from that bank account. If we continue to make withdrawals within a bank account and very few deposits, pretty soon it's bankrupt. And then we wonder why it's gone sour and why it's gone into bankruptcy, so to speak. When that respect is there, it is each individual respecting, first of all, their own relationship with God. They go deep within their souls if they are devotees and if they are what they should be, seeking out that oneness, seeking out that light. And then they bring the fullness of what they experience within into the relationship. The human way of entering into relationship is, what can you do for me? And when you act and speak in a particular way, then I'm happy. And when I'm happy, then I give you something good in return. If you don't act toward me in the way that I want you to, then I'm unhappy and I begin to withhold from you. And this is what is called normal marriage sadism. <laughs> I withhold, you withhold, Pretty soon there's a huge gulf between the two people. And then they wonder why they feel so alone, even though they're in a married state. So the first commitment goes for the sadhaka into their own spiritual nature and delving deeply into that, and then giving of the fullness of the spiritual nature that they have within into the relationship such a different way of entering into relationship versus what can you do for me? And if you do the things that I like, then I'll do the things that you like and vice versa. But first you give to me. When you enter into a spiritual relationship, it's I want to give to you out of the fullness of my own being. And when you have two souls that are doing that, then it magnifies the light that is within the relationship and within each one of those. And the light that is brought in is greater than what either one of the individuals contributes because it is a spiritualized relationship at that point. And that light can begin to grow and there is peace and there is harmony. It doesn't mean that there aren't differences. You know, as I've sometimes said, where two or more are gathered, there shall be politics. <laughs> and politics is the art of negotiation, the art of taking two different points of view and somehow coming to some working re relationship between those individuals. And so it's not, uh, you know, uh, Norman Vincent Peale one time said, he says, you know, once in a while you hear about marriages where there's never been an argument. And 50 years of marriage, there's never been one argument. He says, just putting aside the plausibility of this uh, from ever happening, he says, my God, what a boring couple of people that would ever be, never have any kind of difference of opinion. And of course, uh, those who knew uh, Mother Hamilton and her husband uh, knew that they were both very strong personalities and they brought those personalities into full bearing in their relationship. So it is not about becoming a non-entity. But one other thing that they did, and Mother talked about when they saw Papa Ramdas, that they would sit together and they would talk about God. And as they talked about God, they would just see and be enveloped in this wonderful light coming in as they spoke about God and the spirits were uplifted. When individuals are involved in their own spiritual growth and understanding and have made that commitment first, then that begins to inform the commitment between two people. And so first comes that internal connection with the light and with God, and through the abundance of that 
is brought into the relationship. And then when you have two people who are making that commitment together, then the light from that relationship becomes tremendous indeed. There are times when relationships can become so harmful that perhaps that commitment cannot be kept. But we see so many examples today where people just, I don't know, they have kind of a restlessness. They have kind of a feeling that it's not, the marriage is not what they would think that it should be. And so they give up on it. But oftentimes they are giving up too quickly because they're not pushing through their own personal boundaries, their internal boundaries. That the intimacy that they're looking for is oftentimes locked up inside of themselves. And they look to the other person to solve their problem. When both individuals take responsibility for delving more deeply into their own spiritual nature, then they take full responsibility for themselves. And when they're glowing with that light and shining with that light, then they're not looking just what they can receive and get out of it from the other person, but they are fully involved and invested in what they're giving. And I think that is the most beautiful thing. One of the things I love to see between married couples is when two, both individuals speak with such respect for the other one within the relationship. They truly engender that kind of form of, of respect. And when that happens, there's a certain separation. There's not that sense of ownership. There's not that sense of being over familiar, but it's standing back and appreciating that one, seeing the goodness that is within them, and then acting that out through actions, words that reflect those thoughts. When we do that, you see, we grow spiritually because by taking responsibility first of what's inside of us, instead of just finding what's at fault with the other person, we force ourselves to grow. We push ourselves beyond our own limitations, beyond our own boundaries. And we bring so much more into the relationship. And so I think that commitment starts there. And then the second part of that agreement is bringing that light into the relationship, that fullness, that divine love, that divine light. And as I say, when you see that in the world in relationships, I don't think there's anything more beautiful or wonderful. Which brings me to the guru disciple. <laughs> mm. The next step. <laughs> the spiritual marriage, so to speak. And of course, when the guru makes the commitment to the disciple, they are committing themselves completely because they recognize within the disciple that this is God come to them in human form. And it is a sacred commitment. It is something that is not entered into lightly and only with the consent of that inner divine command. When the disciple comes in, they do not necessarily have that same clarity of purpose. Some do and some don't. It's a little bit more mixed because the personality is still in a state of ignorance. But as disciples, that we come into that commitment fully committed to our own spiritual growth, fully committed to absorbing the teachings and putting them into practice within our own life. Now, it is not accepting the teachings from the guru 
from a mental standpoint alone. In the beginning, that's what is required because we can only understand with our mind. But that the commitment ultimately is toward our own realization and that by following the precepts of the Guru, we make progress towards that by surrendering ourselves to the teachings of the Guru in the outer sense until that inner Guru fully awakens within us. And then we find that there is no separation, there is no difference between the inner and the outer. The same vibration of truth that we find within ourselves is exactly the same vibration of truth we found within the Guru. And so we commit ourselves 100% to finding that truth, to following the teachings of the Guru. Not blindly, but as a scientific scientist, so to speak, endeavoring for truth, endeavoring to discover that realized state of being that we all yearn to be. Now there are many who come to the Guru and perhaps even some who take initiation and they last for a little while like um, a quickly burning match. They come and they go. They get something of what they need and then they move on their way. But for those who want their complete and full realization, that commitment begins with their loyalty and their desire to follow the Guru. Mother used to emphasize so often the quality of loyalty. And I grew up in a generation that threw out so many traditional values. I think loyalty was one of those. We didn't discuss it much. It wasn't much in the air. You were pretty much in it for yourself. And the idea of having loyalty to another wasn't something that was engendered all that much. So it came to me as something of um, a revelation, something that stimulated my thinking around that. Well, what is that exactly? What am I being loyal to? And what I realized is that by staying in the arena with my guru, even as master stayed in the arena, with his guru. He did not avoid him. That when I made that commitment, because it wasn't always easy, it was tough. It's very difficult, the most difficult thing in many ways that I've ever had to do. But when I kept that commitment and I didn't avoid her and I stuck in the arena no matter what, I grew spiritually. It strengthened my will, it strengthened in my commitment, and there's just no words that I can use to describe how that changed me, how she changed me. It wasn't just through her words and actions, it was by being in her presence, both when I was in her physical presence but also when I was at great distances and I was in her spiritual presence, even though that there is great distance between us. And that commitment that I kept within my own soul, I would say, meant more towards my own spiritual evolution than anything else, any other single thing that I have done any other part of my sadhana that I have practiced, any of it. By keeping that inner attunement, by keeping that outer commitment, by keeping both. And my own experience tells me that those who perfect themselves in keeping that level of commitment are the ones who grow, they're the ones who make it. And those that waver on that are the ones who eventually go away from it, do not make the spiritual growth. They don't continue. 
And because of that, I would say that it's essential to the spiritual growth of the, indivi of the individual sadhaka. Would you say the purpose and the outcome of this association is to um, relate only to the inner guru? In a way that um, marriage tends to rub off the rough edges between two souls, and it is by that close contact and connection that the rubbing happens and the smoothness begins to happen. Even so, in the relationship between the outer relationship between guru and disciple, a similar kind of thing happens. So it's not, um, the process is not just about uh, finding the inner guru and kind of walking away satisfied with that. Uh, the process is that rubbing up against each other that begins to refine the soul and refine the soul's attunement towards that. And as I said earlier, when we begin to realize that inner light within us, we recognize that there's no difference between that inner light and the inner light that's within the Guru, that's being openly manifest. So from that standpoint, it kind of makes the question moot. The, the kind of definition of what's mine and what's my guru's <laughs> lose, loses meaning at some point. There doesn't feel to be any difference. And it's not that there's a lack of definition of the individual, but it's that the spirit becomes so predominant. And that it's the same spirit that inhabits the guru and that inhabits the disciple. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right with the commitment. Without that commitment, you couldn't stand, you couldn't continue to tolerate that rubbing, yeah. that, that chafing sometimes, and because it gets difficult and you want to go away. You do. So it's only, I would say the same thing, that the commitment for me has been, what's been most valuable in, mm -hmm. in my, what I've learned from others. It builds, an, and marriage reflects that as well, it builds a crucible, a crucible in the sense of um, what a metallurgist will construct in order to bring different kinds of metals and they'll heat it up and those metals will begin to form an alloy that's something different than what either one of the two metals originally were that's, when done properly, is very strong. The relationship is that crucible, and within that crucible, the, the personality of the guru and the light of the guru and of the disciple begin to bubble up and begin to merge and create something that is new and stronger than anything that the disciple could have had on their own. And within marriage, the marriage relationship, when it's kept in its sacredness, when it's kept in its, that respect, that all goes into forming a very strong crucible for that, that alchemy to happen. What happens in many marriage relationships is that the construction of that crucible is not complete um, with disrespect, with over-familiarity, with a lack of commitment, with a lack of keeping agreements, cracks begin to form within that crucible and the materials begin to spill out through the cracks and so the alchemy, the transformation never occurs. The completeness of what that relationship can be always falls short 
but when there's real thought and care and mutual respect that goes into building that crucible, then it becomes strong enough for that transformation to take place. I think one of the challenges now and into the future is giving a lot more conscious attention to constructing those crucibles. That in the past it's been many relationships, many marriages have been kept together through property and through uh, strong social kinds of reinforcements. And that's what kind of kept the outer crucible together, but the, it, it really still wasn't strong enough to make that transformation happen. With the taking away of a lot of those social strictures, what we're called upon now is for the two individuals to really make the strength there. And to keep that together and really find the true purpose and fulfillment for that, for that transformation to happen within the relationship. And again, the same kind of principles, not to avoid each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not easy to do. Not easy to do. And you get into the intensity of the differences coming forward and not to avoid each other, to hang in there, to build a crucible that is strong enough for that alchemy to happen. And then I think that the synergy that happens around that, the accumulation of light and power becomes a magnificent thing for the world. I think that's the marriages of the future. <clears throat> the, um, this confusion that reigns in the New Age world about giving up the guru and going past the guru is a way of getting away from taking teaching too. And it, um, we see so much of this where the guru is difficult to be with, perhaps. And so. The only proper way that I think that it is correct to think of leaving the guru or going beyond the guru is in the inner. The, and you'll see this in all masters, the deference to the outer, in, the, in any outer play, the disciple in that role always defers to the master outwardly. He doesn't uh, denounce or renounce or um, have, you know, disdain in any way. There, that love never changes. Yeah. But inwardly, that strength is so great, the, the attraction from God is so great, that I think the gurus come back and tell us this story because they know that I had to leave the outer form of the guru in order to go the final miles. Mm -hmm. Because the inner guru pulls them so strongly. And since the outer guru taught them to go with the strength of the truth that is within themselves, they then know to make that step it's a necessary step. I think that it's between the sixth and the seventh chakra that the guru, out of guru, can do no more good. Mm -hmm. If you can't make that inner step, you, you're going to be stick, stuck in the outer world of phenomena. Mm -hmm. But any outward play, I still think, I would maintain that you would never know it. If this, if this is an experience that you go through, <clears throat> then it would not play, and it, it comes back as a teaching. We know that many teachers uh, great teachers say this, that they had to, and Ron Christian talks about slicing the Divine Mother up, <laughs> sort of discrimination. It sounds cruel and sounds odd, but I think it must be him that way too, mm -hmm. very strongly. He felt that that wasn't right, but he once he had done it, he realized that it was the only solution, and he was clinging to that out of form. But and yet like, afterwards, his love and devotion for the Divine Mother was unchanged. How really displayed, exactly. The same. But his vision was universalized. And I think that that's the measurement in terms of our own experience. The potential limitation that comes to the commitment toward the guru is that our vision can be um, localized with the guru versus universalized. When you see the same light that's within the guru shining everywhere, then there, there is no problem, there's no difficulty, but to go beyond the form, and if the form is a sticking point, well, 
that's only where the light, or that's where the light primarily resides, or that's where it comes from. No, then it becomes an obstacle. In my life, I didn't do it exactly the same way my own guru did it, and that's the perfect way, so therefore I can't get there. Right. That's another idol worship, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's subtle. Mm-hmm. It is subtle. Because from a human standpoint, we can, as you pointed out, be too quick to throw the guru overboard. And that um, real spiritual masters always revere and love their guru and give them credit for everything, and yet they go beyond them in the sense that they're no longer localized. They're not, um, what's the saying for when somebody is too colloquial or you know, too, <coughs> provincial. too provincial? That's it. They're no longer spiritually provincial. <laughs> they are spiritually universal. It explains also that Papa could meet Ramana Maharshi once, and not in the sense that we don't know the relationship of guru, disciple, and all that, but he certainly took him from But he always had him in here. He knew him inside. Yeah. And he knew when he was about to leave the body, he told people to go over and see him. He knew always what was going on in the And it wasn't necessary at all. That was a strength of Papa. It wasn't a, mm-hmm. a weakness. It was a refusal of Ramana Maharshi, but he had him with him. Mm-hmm. But it was the same way. Mm-hmm. Well, I was thinking about this last night when we listened to one of Mother's tapes, and uh, she was saying that uh, she loved Yogananda with all her heart and all her soul, and um, he was her God, you know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there wasn't any emotion that she didn't have for him, and um, she said it wasn't until he was gone that she realized that um, that had kept her from um, approaching uh, God within her and knowing that. It's a two-edged sword, you know, because her love and devotion for Master kept her mind on God, and which is a wonderful thing to have happen. But at some point, you have to go beyond that. You have to, uh, you know, as the, as the saying in the book goes, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> and, but if you are just starting out on the road and your love and your devotion for God are not complete, then love and devotion for the Guru is a way to set yourself on fire and let that conflagration burn until you're desire, your yearning for God is so great that you cannot live without it any longer. And when your love and devotion is that great, then to go beyond the Guru and go into the universal nature of the self. Symbol worship, uh, idol worship, so to speak, worshiping different images of God and that kind of thing are great stepping stones at the right time in the evolution. They really become a focal point for the devotee. And if they didn't have that focal point, if they only had to take the universal nature, the mind wouldn't, couldn't identify with it. It wouldn't become inflamed in the same way. And so it would be wrong to say that it serves no purpose or that it's something that needs to be avoided. Uh, as long as the mind has that predisposition to go that way, then it can be a great aid. But as I say, there comes a point in the evolution where that image has to be destroyed. But my romance with Mother, as all the deputies, the romance with Mother played such an important part in awakening the sleeping God within me. And that's true for, for all devotees in their, in their upward march. Do you think it's, it's kind of like we, we maybe know that we have to eventually go beyond the, the guru in the form of the guru and go to the universal guru within. But you can know that, but your focus should still be on the guru mm. because when it is necessary for you to do that, you can go and do it then. Mm-hmm. But to focus on the fact of, well, I've got to get beyond the guru, 
Mm -hmm. then you get rid of the guru, too, you might get rid of the guru too soon. You have to just continue to focus on the guru because you will, you will know the time when it's time to go well, beyond. Perhaps. Uh, the guru will tell you or, or you, will know, you will just know. And, and until then, it's no point in focusing on the fact that you've got to get beyond your guru. Because perhaps <laughs> an apt analogy would be um, going to university and finding a professor in a subject that you are going to pursue and you just love that subject. Now, if you walked in uh, after taking one or two classes and you pretended you knew more than the professor did, <laughs> you're going to get cut down pretty quick. And it would be improper to do it. But if you were to continue into your own PhD studies and then perhaps uh, doing your own research and you never went beyond the professor, you never strayed outside of the professor's thinking or way of approach, you would limit yourself and you would not fulfill your own potential within your own researches. And so knowing uh, at some point that there, is a, that there is a time when you have to allow your own inner light to grow past what you've received on the outside. Now, again, this is a worldly kind of an analogy, but you would never look back on that professor and say, oh, I shouldn't have been so enamored with him or, you know, he played a great role or she played a great role in your own development at that time and, and a proper role. And if you were, if you were the right kind of student, you always give that teacher credit. And Full credit, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't you, um, but wouldn't it be sort of a natural, a natural, um, that if you, your main goal and your commitment was God, mm -hmm. that all the rest just happens. There's no sort of, well, I'm going to do this when this happens and this when right. this happens. It's like, by keeping your commitment, by keeping your focus and your commitment on God, that all those things, just the guru comes into your life and, the, and you accept the guru and you, 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 um, your commitment to the guru grows as your as as long as your commitment with God is always there. That that commitment with your guru just I think as happen. long as your conception of God entails the universal vision, the highest state of attainment. I think you're absolutely right. That your own experience will tell you whether you are living in that universal vision or not. And if you are not, then you have some distance to go. Now, is that uh, going beyond the guru or is that <coughs> perfecting your own sadhana in the moment? But your experience will tell you that as well. If you reach the end of your own sadhana with your guru and you say, all right, it's time to cut the guru into ribbons. Hopefully that's done figuratively and not literally. <laughs> 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 then, uh, then, then you'll know. You'll know when you've bumped up against those limitations. And uh, there's all different kinds of idol worships that we get into on the way. And there's a psychological term called transitional metaphors. And it is using a metaphor, knowing that it's limited knowing that it's not the complete truth, the full truth, but it's useful to get you where you're going to the next step. <laughs> so if somebody is trying to um, overcome some childhood difficulty, they may become very enraged with their mother or their father or something that happened during their childhood. That rage is a transitional state to go through. It's certainly not the psychological summation that you want to arrive at and be in a perpetual rage about mother or father or whatever that situation was, and yet it's a necessary stage to go through. And so in our own sadhana, we make the best mental calculation we can at the highest light that we can, knowing that that's a transitional metaphor, knowing that that's a transitional state, and yet we have to go through that in order to reach the highest. 
So then, um, at this point, would you agree then that um, in disconnecting from personal relationship uh, with a guru, like uh, when Yogananda died and his mother died, um, then the next step is to see that um, light that you saw in this uh, individual within everybody here. That kind of Why wait till death? Yeah. You know, that's always our... <laughs> But, I mean, to realize it. I think one of the easiest ways to, to um, go from the personal to the impersonal, see, uh, Manaji did that with Papa. She didn't, she didn't relate to the word Ram very well. It left her cold. So she searched around for, how can I make God personal? How can I make him feel close? To her, it was Papa. And that term and her reflection on Papa Ramdas was to her a way that made her feel very close to God. That God was very knowable and experienceable because she had that experience in her own life. Then for her, Papa became the creative force of the whole universe. Papa was who was within every individual who she met. So her way of universalizing it was not necessarily destroying Papa, but it was universalizing Papa. I had an experience once where I saw mother, mother's image on the chest of every person that I met. And these barriers that I hadn't even realized were around me between myself and other people just dropped. They just, and, and it wasn't of my own doing, it just happened, it was an experience. And all these barriers dropped from around me, and I saw mother, Mother's image within the chest of everyone I saw. And I just, it was such an experience. Such an experience. It was her in the sense of I was seeing her image, but the spirit was absolutely universal. So the other way of universalizing that relationship is to see that divine relationship within every person whom you meet to see it as all-pervading, beginningless and endless. And so you can actually use the strength of that relationship and then universalize it in that way as well. Can you talk um, a little bit on the differences between your relationship with your guru and then the lineage of gurus? Well, Individualized teachings in there and all that kind of thing, so it's... It's always, uh, you know, our own guru has come into our life for us. And yet they are a part of the lineage that uh, sometimes I poetically thought, like coming from the headwaters of the Ganges all the way down, uh, flowing all the way down through the guru channels. And so the teachings that we get from our guru are personalized to us. And yet they are intimately connected with everything that came before them. In my own experience, I've felt my closeness with the different gurus in our own guru lineage at different times. It's like suddenly they made themselves known to me. And before I may have... They were a name, I knew some stories about them, maybe a certain feeling, how I imagined them to be. Suddenly they became an inner living presence, something knowable, something I could relate with, someone I could ask questions and get responses back to. And one of the things that I noticed was that the same purity of spirit that I experienced in mother, that I experienced within myself, I saw within them. But each one of them had a signature of personality that was uniquely their own. And it just ex helped to expand my own vision of the divine because they all had different personalities, different ways of relating. And so it was quite wonderful 
to do that. And I think that that is another way to help universalize our vision is to see the God that resides within each one of the masters, to accept the blessings that come through them. And at the same time, avoiding becoming provincial. That, oh, God only flows through this lineage. No, that's not it. That's not the purpose. But you get a special love. It's like having a special love for your own parents. When you're a child, you may go to somebody else's house, and they too had parents. And maybe they made dinner for you, and you sat down, you all ate dinner. But you would never mistake those parents for your parents. You always knew who your parents were. And you knew who your grandparents were, and perhaps on up the line that way. And so in that way, you have your guru lineage. You always know who they are, but you can love and respect all lineages. And yet there's that special feeling in your heart and in your relationship with them that is, has that peculiarity of, of love and respect for your own lineage. Because they're the ones who made the sacrifice that ultimately, in their own lives, that ultimately resulted in you being put on the spiritual path in the way that you have. And so there's a special love and affinity for that. And yet you can respect all lineages, all godmen, all godwomen, the world over. And that too helps to universalize our, our view of the path and that God comes in so many different forms. So the upshot is that God is both personal and impersonal. We, are, we too are both personal and impersonal. We go inside and we feel the depth of our own sense of peace, our own sense of wholeness, completeness, oneness with God. It's impersonal. It, it's not a personal kind of a thing. And then we come out into the world and we relate in a very personal way. And as our vision begins to universalize, we feel that flow of divine spirit flowing at us in all directions, in all experiences. And we feel it coming back to us through all people and all experiences. And then we just see ourselves as swimming in this vast ocean of spirit. And it's just, it's resonating in the air, in the walls, in the ceilings, in all people. And there is no difference, and we feel like a fish swimming in this ocean of spirit. And so we have that, and then we are also relating on a personal plane. And it's confusing sometimes. When Mataji first saw Matt Papa, she says, but you're, you treat some people one way and other people another way. He says, yes, but I see everyone as God. That's just God, how God operates through me. And as long as we operate in a, through a human body and interacting with the world, there will be that separation. But within the vision, within the consciousness of the guru, there is no separation. Even though it seemingly flows to one and maybe not another, or one person is treated in a different way than another, there is no difference. They're just simply impersonally responding to the God within them and how that flows and how that operates. But they themselves see everything equally as God. And so somebody who is being treated harshly, perhaps, or in difficult ways, can be the recipient of the most love from the guru. You know, if you're, if you're a coach or a teacher, you might be toughest on the ones who have the most potential, because you could expect more. You want more from them. Whereas somebody who's really struggling just to be in the class, you might give them lots of support, lots of love, lots of attention, because they need that. So it's not always who the guru is nice to. <laughs> That's a demonstration of their spirit. Sometimes it's the ones who they're tough on. And they're the ones who can rise up to something greater, something bigger. And they know it, and they see that potential. So they want to draw them out of that. We 
had a long service tonight, so why don't we have our closing prayer? O Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, I feel the wonder and the beauty of thy glorious presence in every part of my being. My heart is bursting with my love for thee. I kneel in adoration at thy feet and surrender myself to thee. I feel the power of thy perfection surging in every cell of my body. My mind and my intelligence are radiant with thy healing light. My soul is filled with the ecstasy and bliss of my communion with thee. I and my Father are one. Blessed Spirit, I am he. with the commitment to realize the greatest goal that life has to offer, to come into the realization of who and what we truly are. May it be with us night and day, night and day, until we achieve that great pinnacle of God consciousness, the universal vision. Be it so.